to have a chance to take a, a whole session to talk about reading and books is just unbelievable. When I was a sophomore in high school, I bought this set of books called The Great Books of the Western World. And uh, my, my family still teases me when I go back home because they say, when you were a kid, you would bring a book to every meal. And I grew up on a farm. And every time I'd go out on the tractor to work for a day, I'd have a book in the toolbox because you don't want to be stuck without a book, you know? So several weeks ago on Facebook, one of my uh, Facebook friends from Lithuania posted that she was reading the autobiography of a very liberal American leader, a woman who is an outspoken advocate of late-term abortion, something that only four governments in the world endorse, Vietnam, China, North Korea, and some other place. She's a big advocate of homosexuality and pro-euthanasia and supports same-sex marriage and transgenderism. And my friend was reading her autobiography. And I know we're still developing rules on what's nice to say and what's not nice to say on Facebook. And I don't normally respond, you know? But I just had to say something. And I, I protested. I said, why, why are we reading books like this? And I listed all these things that this woman is an advocate of when there are so many books of great and godly men and women that we need to emulate. We need to be imitating these kinds of people instead of adoringly reading, especially somebody's autobiography. I mean, it was not even critical to read their autobiography. And it was, of course, as you probably guessed, the new autobiography of Michelle Obama, whose presidency brought more restrictions on religious freedom and greater access to abortion and endorsement of all sorts of immoral activities, plus a great increase in racism in America. And I just, I thought, all of a sudden, I had this vision. I understood all of a sudden why we're seeing so much anemic Christianity, not only in North America, but where I work all across Europe. Now, my work is primarily with academics. And so we academics read a lot. And I understand there are some things we need to read for research. I understand that. But for easy reading, for casual reading, I really want to issue a call to us as believers that we are focused in our reading. And in fact, what I did, I went through and summarized what I thought were some of the very best books that Christians should read. Because we do. Whatever country you are from, we're seeing a widespread spiritual lethargy. And we're seeing an anemic Christianity. And I believe one part of it is because we're feeding in bad stuff. There's an old saying that came out of the, you all aren't old enough to remember, but the early days of a computer age, there's this expression, GIGO, G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. And so my point is today, we need Christian classics in, and hopefully we'll have a little more maturity coming through our lives. Here's the bottom line. What we read ultimately shapes our thinking and shapes our lives. And so we've got to be serious about what we read. We have to be careful about what we read. One of my favorite verses is in Philippians 4, 8. And of course, it's a famous verse, but I have to go back to it periodically because I think somehow our fallen natures are attracted to the bad stuff. But Paul said, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Now, 
Terry, my wife here, has just been leading a women's Bible study in Romans this spring. And so we've been spending, I've been reading along with her and the group to kind of get back into it. And just the other day in my devotions in Romans 16, 19, Paul reminds us we are to be innocent about what is evil. And so that should figure into our, our reading schedule. So this list, I just want to give you a little introduction, then we'll kind of walk through it. I'll highlight some, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. But for both of us, reading is very important. Um, I'll mention this at the end, but we read together every night. Now, I think it's a minimal that married couples would pray together on a daily basis. But I th we also believe very much that couples should read together. So we read scripture every night. And then we read through classics, uh, not necessarily Christian classics, but we're reading through classic literature. And I would say it's, you can ask her afterwards, but I, th I think it's one of the things that's been helpful when you have two very strong, at least an opinionated, opinionated man and a very intelligent woman matched up. It helps us to be at peace with one another, to read together. It's a good discipline. Now, uh, one other thing, there's a lot of places where you can get free books. So uh, 20 years ago, I couldn't say this, but now we have so much access. So you don't have to buy a Kindle or a Nook. You can load the app on your phone, on your computer. And so almost all of my reading is through Kindle books. And I know I don't prefer I don't like Kindle books as much as I like a real print book, but when you're traveling all the time, it's kind of a necessity rather than taking another suitcase for 50 pounds of books. It's just, so I've listed here some of the sources that I know about for free books, and, uh, or at least cheap books, because typically e-books are cheaper. Now, looking through that, you can see there's a lot of sources, and. The last two are especially for Christian books. The uh, CCEL, that's a great collection that uh, has been put together by a couple of professors from Calvin and Wheaton. And then the Church on the Threshold has a lot of Christian classics. And especially the older the book is, the more likely you are to find it for free. So like on, on our trip here this week, I was reading Thomas Watson's book on the Lord's Prayer. And I think I paid a whopping 99 cents for the book. And here it's a classic that 20 years ago would have probably cost me 20, 20 bucks. So look at this list and at the end, if we have some time, we'll talk about other places you're aware of. So my list, because I'll be pr presenting some of these free sources at another workshop I'm doing for our Cambridge Scholars Network in a few weeks. So here's the ground rules. I'm not trying to give you all the best books on particular fields like apologetics, or worldview or leadership or other areas. Now I've included a few books just because a few are like mountain peaks that any Christian book list would be remiss to leave out. Any book list is a reflection of the person who put it together. So I'm kind of a bottom line kind of person. Uh, I've studied philosophy and theology a lot, but I'm kind of, I wanna know how it translates into real life and you're, you'll probably see a little bit of this, so you're not gonna see a lot of esoteric philosophy books in here. You're gonna see more what happens when truth meets life. And just because a book is on this list does not mean I agree with everything in that book, nor with every position taken by the author of that book. Now I do draw some lines and I'll talk about those lines at the end. But um, I think it's important for us to understand, I can think a book is really great and not agree. I mean, I told of the academic network this morning, my wife and I disagree on a lot of really important issues. Like she's a Calvinist, I'm an Arminian. Uh, she's a Pentecostal, I was raised anti-Pentecostal. She believes in some positions that I, she, she brought up to the group that she drinks, drinks alcohol. I don't. And she says it takes quite a bit for her to live with me. So, you know, we can disagree. So I'm saying, 
can't the rest of us agree to disagree about some stuff, okay? And hopefully you haven't jumped to some conclusion, some conclusion just because of what I've just listed. So, I've added an asterisk to a few of the books that I think are just ones that every Christian leader really, really should read at some point in their lives. Now, why I started with biographies kind of because that was what sparked this whole workshop on my Facebook interchange. And um, the interchange did not go well, of course. You could have guessed that. Um, the, it just brought more people um, saying, yeah, I want to read Ob <coughs> Michelle Obama's book as well. So it didn't, kind of backfired. So let me just walk through a few of these. Then um, if you see something that catches your interest, you stop me along the way. Uh, look at page two. I've listed a lot of biographies, and that's more what person do you want to, to learn more about, of course. And I've listed a wide variety of people. <clears throat> Look, and I list these in order, in the alphabetical order of the person about whom the biography or autobiography is written. So about midway down, you've got a book by Eileen Crossman, Mountain Rain, a biography of James O. Fraser. Fraser was an amazing missionary to the Lisu people in China. And this story is a gripping story of missionary commitment, of prayer, of miracles, it's just, an, and I happen to know Eileen Crossman and her husband Douglas, so it meant even more to know the children of uh, the child of this great missionary. And the next one, To the Golden Shore. This is one of the classic missionaries of Adoniram Judson, who lost several wives and several children to death and sickness as a missionary to Burma. And it's a very honest accounting where Judson struggled late in his life with depression and a sense of, did I waste my life? Am I totally depraved? And I've been doing this all for my own benefit. It's really a very transparent coverage of a godly man's life. There's a lot of biographies of C.S. Lewis. is one of the men I lecture on, of course, for academics. But one of my, I have two of my favorites here by uh, Roger Green, who was a very close friend of, of Lewis's, and George Sayer, who is one of his dearest friends, and both of those give us a real insight into what made Lewis tick and his walk with God in particular. Well, we just celebrated the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, and the old classic is still my favorite, Ron, Roland Baton's uh, uh, biography of Luther, Here I Stand. It's an amazing book that is spiritually refreshing and uh, historically informative. And then the second one from the bottom, Merrily Pierce Dunker. Man of vision, woman of prayer. Bob Pierce was a, a missionary who founded an organization called Samaritan's Purse. And before that, before he got kicked out, he founded World Vision. Great visionary, but his life was really troubled. And he caused a lot of damage in his family, uh, wrecked his family, wrecked his marriage. Uh, he struggled with alcoholism, just a lot of struggles with depression. And this is a book that is good for leaders to remind themselves of their need for carefulness and caution and paying attention to the home fronts. And then Terry and I just finished reading this last one, Chasing the Dragon by Jackie Pullinger, who was an amazing, just a young English girl who took a ship the cheapest fare, she had so many pounds, English pounds, and she went to the shipping company and said, where can I go with this, many, the, with this much money? And it took her to Hong Kong. She knew God wanted her to serve, and she wanted to get as far into the field of missions as she could. And she went there and started this amazing mis mission among the down and out, I mean, the drug lords, the triad section of Hong Kong. And then through prayer and perseverance, she saw amazing turnarounds through these drug lords and criminals in Hong Kong until actually they, had, they, they renovated a whole part of the city because the, society, the culture had changed so much. So many of them had come to Christ and been filled with the Holy Spirit, dramatically delivered from drugs. And it was all from one little English girl doing her faithful part there in Hong Kong, so it's an amazing story. <clears throat> and 
Now, on the next page, Don Richardson is one of my favorite. How many, how many of you have ever read anything by Don Richardson? He's a, a gripping author. Now, of course, Peace Child is his most famous one, where it's his story as a missionary in Arian Jaya, and among this tribe, that their ultimate value is betrayal. So the most noble, virtuous thing you can do is betray your closest friend. So when he tells them the story of Judas betraying Jesus and thinking they'll be gripped with a sense of their own sinfulness and saying, that's who I am, they cheer. They actually cheer Judas because he's the hero for them. And he has to look at their culture <clears throat> and find a way to portray the miracle of, re of Christ's redemption for us and thus peace child. You, you've got to read it. It's, a, it's an amazing story. But another very gripping story about another missionary is, an, uh, about, is called Lords of the Earth. And this is a story of an Australian missionary who was so cantankerous, he kept getting kicked out of one missions organization after another. He couldn't get along with anybody. He was a curmudgeon. He was cantankerous. Nobody liked him. He was awful. And yet, this is the story of how he became the hero that helped lead a whole tribe to Christ. It's not an endorsement of being a curmudgeon, but it's an endorsement of God can use even the roughest of diamonds to do his, to do his work. Well, of course, Corey Ten Boom is uh, one of my all-time heroes, heroines, and so her book, Hiding Place, and then Tramp for the Lord. Tramp for the Lord is a story of her traveling around the world as a missionary, and every time I read it, I'm reminded of just the practical lessons of walking with God in a very real way. Now, <clears throat> next we go to history. And I haven't marked many that would be outstanding in that sense. The fact that they're on the list means they're outstanding, but uh, that's a matter of what part of history you're wanting to read. J. Edwin Orr was a, a Welsh scholar, and he wrote a lot about revival, and I have one book on here of the eager feet. There's uh, my favorite all over history is by Latterette, A History of Christianity, and it's, it makes church history come alive. On page five, I have some books on the difference that Christianity has made. Actually, I'm doing a seminar for the Advanced Apologetics Network tomorrow. And this one is Under the Influence, How Christianity Transformed Civilization. Because much of my work is lecturing at universities show, using history as apologetics, showing how God worked in actual events and changed history. And you'll see that one of my favorite historians, he's actually a sociologist, is uh, Rodney Stark. And his book, The Rise of Christianity, is a book that every church planter should read because it's a reminder of the power of the early church and why it, was, why it took over the Mediterranean world so quickly. But even his book, um, God's Battalions, The Case for the Crusades. I've done part of a perspectives course on the, the Islamic world. And Rodney Stark's take on the Crusades is a healthy antidote to this uh, unhealthy guilt that many Christians have about the Crusades. He really puts history back into perspective. Okay, now we get to the real topic of the book list, and that is growth in Christ. What are some good books that we need to be reading to help us grow in Christ? Well, <clears throat> I'll highlight some of the, some of the best. That first one by Arthur Bennett, The Valley of Vision. This is a collection of Puritan prayers and devotions that anytime I'm struggling or need a fresh touch from God, this book is one that I go to because it's, it's classic Puritan prayers rooted in Scripture, and it's a healthy reminder, I really need Jesus every day. Now, of course, you're familiar with the famous devotional books, My Utmost for His Highest by Oswald Chambers, Streams in the Desert. My wife and I have really enjoyed devotional classics by Richard Foster. Now, Richard was one of her professors in college, so naturally that personal connection makes a difference. But devotional classics is a selection of readings from great Christians throughout church history. So you've got everybody from Augustine, to Lewis, 
to Wesley, to Calvin. So you're, you're really getting all across the, uh, the theological map, but how do you follow God? And he divides it into readings on the prayer-filled life, the virtuous life, the spirit-empowered life, the compassionate life, and the word-centered life. So you've got Pascal, you've got Chrysostom, you've got Watchman Nee, E. Stanley Jones, and it's a rich collection of readings. Now, on prayer and revival, back again to Richard Foster. The best book, one of the best books I've ever read on prayer is his book, Simply Prayer, Finding the Heart's True Home. I've got to tell you that um, I struggle with prayer. Um, my wife uh, diagnosed me as ADHD, and I think my prayer life would, would pretty well certify that. When I try to pray, my brain is bouncing all over the ceiling and the wall. I have a very hard time focusing. And when I start to pray, a whole list of the things I need to do that week come to my mind. And so it's a really tough discipline for me to pray and especially to intercede. So my prayer life is not one that you would want to emulate. It's a, it's a struggle. So I need books like this to take me back to my knees and not simply give in to oh, well, my mind's wandering, I'll quit, and I'll, I'll pray later. So Foster's book, The um, Prayer, Finding the Heart's True Home, is one of those that are just a real classic. The next one by Ole Hallisby. Uh, Hallisby was a Norwegian professor, and he covers all the must-read aspects of prayer. Prayer is work, wrestling in prayer, the misuse of prayer, the meaning of prayer, problems of prayer, the forms of prayer. It's a classic. And the next one as well, Leonard Ravenhill, who was a British evangelist and preacher, this treasury of prayer that he did the best of E.M. Bounds. E.M. Bounds was a minister back in the 1800s, but Ravenhill put together the best of the best of E.M. Bounds. And this is one, I can't read it without being convicted. McCarthy, you got to get back on your knees because I tend to think, well, I think maybe God needs my work more than my prayers. Now, I've got to pray before I could do anything else. And uh, E.M. Bounds is one that moves me to prayer. Arthur Wallace, in the day of thy power, scriptural principles of revival. The one saying I got out of his book years ago was, God can do more in a day than we can do in a decade. So it's a reminder, and that's one of the themes, of course, of ELF, that we have to be prayer driven. He needs our efforts, but he needs our prayers first of all. And probably the most practical book is by a really great scholar and philosopher who's gone home to be with the Lord now, Dallas Willard, his book, Hearing God, Developing a Conversational Relationship with God. And this is a very balanced, mature, biblically rooted prayer, about our, a book about our relationship with God, especially on hearing from God and understanding His will. And you'll see certain authors that pop up now on this list, and Dallas Willard is one of my go-to. Growth as a Believer, of course, Pilgrim's Progress is the second most published book in history, and I think it's still a, a great classic. Um, Elizabeth Elliot, right there at the end of the page, did a great book, A Slow and Certain Light on Finding Direction from God, so anything by Elizabeth Elliot is excellent. Richard Foster became famous with his book at the top of page seven, Celebration of Discipline, and it really is an excellent book on the spiritual disciplines. So prayer, fasting, study, solitude, silence, worship, how do we practice those and showing how the habits of our body and our mind can start shaping the shape, can reshaping the habits of our heart. And then the challenge of the discipline life Christian Reflections on Money, Sex, and Power, the three biggies that grab most Christian leaders who, who fall. And Richard Foster's uh, response is very scriptural and very practical. How do we respond to these? One, another one of my favorite authors is Oz Guinness, who's spoken here at the forum before. A lot of churches don't know how to deal with young people who have questions. A lot of Christians don't know how to deal with questions they have about doubts. Oz Guinness's book, God in the Dark, The Assurance of Faith Beyond a Shadow of a Doubt, 
is the very best book on the, on, the, on the nature and the role, actually the value of doubt in the Christian's life. And so I would, I really encourage, especially in our academic network, you got to read this because inevitably you're going to come up with questions about your own walk with God. And I ran into those as a late teenager. I was blessed to grow up in a godly home. My mother and my father were serious about their walk with God. My grandparents were. I was surrounded by Christianity. But in my late teens, I knew Jesus was in my heart, but I needed to know the hard evidence. How can I know the Bible's really the Word of God? How can I know Jesus is really who He claimed to be? And how to deal with those doubts. And fortunately, I was not discouraged from asking those questions, but rather encouraged, find the answers, and it's provided a foundation for a lifetime. Now, Roy Hessian is a, is a classic. Any of his books, We Would See Jesus, is a great classic. And of course, the next one, John of the Cross, Loving God Through the Darkness. And you've all heard about the dark night of the soul and how we can understand that many times what we see as depression is actually a time of darkness in which God is testing us. Do we have to have a sense of His presence or blessing, or can we trust Him even in the dark? As, as well as William Law and Brother Lawrence, the practice of the presence of God. Now, of course, the mountaintop classic on this list is Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And I think a lot of Christians now are missing this one because somehow they think it's about apologetics or philosophy or something like this. But mere Christianity is a manual for living for Christ. It's filled with practical, real uh, suggestions for what we need to live faithfully for Christ in our day. And of course, his other letters, the screw tape, his other books, the screw tape letters. It's an upside down world in which you're reading about the advice of a demon to a junior demon on how to lead a new Christian astray. And C.S. Lewis's creative way of turning everything upside down somehow helps us to see, oh man, the devil's tried that on me and I was stupid enough to fall for it. So it gives you good insight into how Satan works. And of course, The Weight of Glory is a, a collection of sermons that Lewis preached and including the one in which there are no mere mortals. Every person you meet is a person that someday you will either fear so much or that you would bow down before. Uh, the Pilgrim's Regress is kind of his allegory on the Pilgrim's Progress, but it tends to be a little more ph philosophical, so it's a little heavier read. Second to the last, Catherine Marshall, The Helper. This is a classic that I think every Christian should read. And actually, ironically, I had not read it until about two years ago. Terry and I took three days to pray and fast. Fasting not just from food, but fasting from phone, computer, uh, any media, and just being alone with each other and alone with God. And part of that was reading scripture and reading through Catherine Marshall's The Helper. Uh, Dallas Willard would often quote Catherine Marshall's experiences in The Helper. And it makes it clear that the scriptural command, we're commanded to be filled with the Spirit and to be led by Him on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. It is a powerful, powerful classic that's a must-read. Now, at the top of page 8, <clears throat> Kathleen Norris is probably not the most um, orthodox from an evangelical perspective. She would probably never be able to speak at an ELF meeting. She probably doesn't dot the I's at the same points we do. But I've gotten a lot of insights from her. She's an Episcopalian um, and a very creative writer. But her book, Acedia and Me, A Marriage, Monks, and a Writer's Life, is a story, is her recounting of one of the seven deadly sins, Acedia, which is the noonday demon or depression or laziness or inaction. I'm not sure. Sloth. Sloth. Thank you, Terry. Uh, and how do we respond? And I think Terry and I read this at a time in our lives, well, obviously I'm past midlife, but uh, it's easy for people in middle, mid or later life to become tired in the battle, to become weary. Sometimes weary just physically, but sometimes weary spiritually. And this book gave us insight into some of the challenges that we were facing 
and just discouragement. Because at, at this stage, it's kind of like if something can go wrong, you've seen it go wrong. And so you can start, I can start getting a little cynical, a little hardened, a little frayed at the edges and weary. And this book helped us to re receive this as one of the deadly sins that Jesus can empower us to respond to, and, he get, and she gives practical solutions for this. Now, of course, another two mountaintop books here are J.I. Packer's A Quest for Godliness, The Puritan Vision of a Christian Life. I mean, this book is packed, packed, packed with a perspective on the Bible, the gospel, the Holy Spirit, the Christian life, and Christian ministry. It deep insights that really will draw you closer to God. And then his all-time classic was Knowing God. I read this not long after it came, came out back in the early 70s, and it's still a classic. I guess 1973 it came out. It's a classic introduction to who God is. Now the problem is a lot of the books about God are really boring, and that what a sad thing. I mean, how do you take somebody, a person who's the living, creative, communicating, majestic person that God is, and make it boring? But theologians have, have managed it, managed to do that very well. I mean, some of the books on God will put you to sleep very fast. Not Packers, <clears throat> because he links it to life and scripture in such a way that you really walk away saying, I want to know God better, and I want to serve Him better. And it helps, helps direct your devotional life and your daily life to say, yeah, I want to I wanna know God's person. I want to know His personality better. I want to understand Him, and, and it helps me to love Him more. Now, another one that probably wouldn't be a speaker at ELF <clears throat> because of some of his, some parts of his life, was a Fuller professor, Louis Smeads. Now, <clears throat> Smeads wrote a great book called Forgive and Forget, Healing the Hurts We Don't Deserve. Now, I can tell you from personal experience that the older I've gotten, the harder it is for me to forgive. I mean, I've been dealing with something just the last few days that I should have forgiven a long time ago, but I'm still grappling with it. And Smeads does a powerful work here on how do we release those hurts to God and let forgiveness come flooding in. I mean, after all, Jesus taught us to pray, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Now, one I didn't mention, I have Smead's autobiography back up in the biography section. Uh, My God and I is what it's called. And I need to warn you, that's, it, it can be pretty raw because Smead struggled all of his life with feeling like God did not love him. And he never did really, as I recall, Terry, he never did reach a point where he was able to rest in the assurance that God loved him. It, so it's a really a heartbreaking book. And it led to broken, some brokenness in his own life. But he, he held on. And the one sign that he had that God did love him was his wife. And so that story autobiography, My God and I, if you ever know anybody that struggles, does God really love me? That would be a book for them to read to, hey, even if you can't convince them, then let them find some sign, some relationship in their life. Okay, I'll hang on to that, even though I don't personally feel loved by God. <clears throat> well, the top one on this page is Corey Ten Boom's Not Good If Detached. Now, <clears throat> God has used this book two or three times to bring a new surge of life in my life. Um, she, Corey Ten Boom, embodies and then describes all that is essential in the daily Christian life. But it's filled with books, uh, stories about daily obedience to Christ, prayer, sharing Christ everywhere, soaking in the Word, using the Word effectively to minister to others, bold confidence. I mean, it's just brimming with wise counsel. And I, every time I read it, I think, Lord, please help me to apply scripture to everyday situations like your daughter, Corey Ten Boom, Ten Boom did. And so we can learn from these people. Now, are you starting to get the drift that, especially 
for some of us like me, for whom the walk with God is not easy and not natural, but some of us have to stay really focused. Do you see now why I'm, I'm so insistent that we read good stuff instead of filling our minds with stuff by some pro-abortionist uh, person that fans racism where they go? We need books that help us want to know God better and then know how to know Him better. And that's what these, these are doing. The old classic is, uh, by Tozer, The Pursuit of God, is still a good book. Here's an excellent, George Allen Taylor, Turner, Witnesses of the Way. It's a hundred brief sketches of famous Christians who yearned for more of God. People like D.L. Moody, Billy Graham, a whole bunch of other people throughout church history who yearned for God and who were filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered to live for Him. Now another classic that I think you can get free now on Kindle is Thomas Watson's. Of course, Watson was one of the great Puritans. Heaven Taken by Storm, showing the holy violence a Christian is to put forth in pursuit after glory. We don't hear a lot of talk about it. it really takes hard work to follow God. But Watson makes that point that you have to be all out. David Wilkerson, a one or another great hero of mine, hungry for more of Jesus. This is a passionate call for a daily walk of close discipleship. Well, now here's two more classics. Dallas Willard, Renovation of the Heart. And here's where he puts, here's, talks about how do we put on the character of Christ? And just from the little that I observed him, he really modeled that out. We had him speak. We had an academic conference every year for a few years, and Dallas would come speak for the conference, and Terry and I would watch him every year. And most academics are not known for either their humility or their gentleness. But Willard lived out these, and he modeled it on a daily basis. And so when he talks about putting on the character of Christ, I'm willing to listen because I saw him do this in his own life. Another bigger book, which is a little more difficult, is The Divine Conspiracy, the bottom one on page 8. Now, Terry calls, having had Richard Foster as her professor, she says Richard Foster is Dallas Willard for dummies. Um, he's giving a more, Foster gives a simpler approach. But Dallas Willard is unpacking the Sermon on the Mount in The Divine Conspiracy. And so, for instance, in my life, I grew up in kind of a legalistic uh, church. Good people, earnest, but probably took their own opinions a little too seriously. And L Dallas Willard's book helped me unpack some of that, and I'm still unpacking it probably, uh, some of the imprint that that uh, legalism had made on my life. But he, he talks especially about kingdom life, and when we talk about God's will being done, understanding that God's will isn't being done most of the time in most instances in the world. Why do you think we have to pray for it to be done? Because every time somebody sins, the definition of sin is God's will was not done. So what does the kingdom mean? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And he talks about the kingdom, discipleship, what heaven will be like. And it's just an amazing, it's a difficult read at times, but really worth the time. Now my top favorite on top of page 9 by Dallas Willard is The Spirit of the Disciplines. And in this book, <clears throat> he shows kind of the psychology of how God works in our lives. Now, da Willard would probably not appreciate that kind of that characterization, but he explains the backdrop of how God works and how His grace interfaces with our actions and the importance of, of practicing the spiritual disciplines. To me, it was a revolutionary book because it has, n not because it has new truths, but because it declares and clarifies and explains the age-old teachings of God's Word and His will for our lives. If you want to understand better what it is that's happening in us when we're growing in Christ, that book is the book. So, Okay, just two or three on evangelism and discipleship. Of course, the great classic is Robert Coleman's The Master Plan of Evangelism, in which he makes the case it's, it's not preaching to masses of people like a Billy Graham, but it's working on two or three people at a time like Jesus did. 
evangelism explosion, I think is still a, a, a classic. And then a friend of ours, Randy Newman, wrote this book, Questioning Evangelism. Now, I'm not very good at this, but I still want to be. His point is, in our postmodern age, we can be more effective in evangelism by simply asking questions. By, instead of making declarative statements, Terry sometimes says that when I'm talking to our kids and grandkids, everything I say is ex cathedra. Uh, it's just kind of a, the way I tend to speak. And Randy's saying, no, McCarthy, you can't do this. You need to ask questions and draw out the searcher, the seeker. And so they come to realize that their position isn't, isn't feasible. Francis Schaeffer called it taking the roof off of someone's worldview and letting the consequences rain down upon them. And Randy Newman is showing us tools for how to do this. Calling, work, and, and vocation. Well, Oz Guinness's The Call is the classic, I believe. A reminder that every person is created by God and is called by God to make a difference in the world. And of course, classic Guinness style. It's filled with helpful illustrations and great quotes that just make the case all over again. Uh, sexuality, marriage, and family. Of course, Gary Chapman's The Five Love Languages is a real classic. Um, chapter 10, Christian Worldview. I have a whole, if you're interested in that, I have a whole book list just on that, but these are some of the best. Os Guinness's Impossible People. I just read, read this a few days ago, and it is probably the most powerful book I believe he's ever written. It's a, a comprehensive analysis from a biblical and spiritual perspective on what's happening in our world today. And it emphasizes the importance of spiritual warfare. And Guinness is without apology. He's critiquing evangelicals who have backed away from the authority of Scripture and its prohibition on lifestyle issues that we're being deluged with now as evangelical. His book is bold without being mean-spirited, and it paints a serious picture of where we are without leaving us feeling hopeless. It's personally challenging, and especially work like you're doing, Pear, in Sweden there with the Clapham Institute. It really provides some direction for political action. How do we match where we see the world spiritually and what do we need to do spirit, uh, politically in response? And this was a follow-up book on his earlier book, Renaissance, The Power of the Gospel, However Dark the Times. And I would see these two as being must-reads for every Christian leader in Europe because it shows the power of the gospel and what are the key tasks we're facing as a church today. Now, this book is getting a little older, but Operation World. How many of you are familiar with Operation World, A Prayer Guide to the Nations? Okay, this is an amazing book that was put together by a couple of uh, British evangelical leaders, and it's, a, it's like a demographic study of the whole world, nation by nation, showing the progress of the gospel in every country. So it actually gives a count. Now, it's now nine years old, so the numbers are a little off, but it'll tell the number of Christians there are in each country, the number of... Uh, religious, the number of the atheists, the number of Muslims, and the number of each major religious group, and then the major challenges to prayer in every nation. And it makes a great book to read through to give you an understanding of what is God doing in the world today and what needs to happen. Okay, let's see here. Apologetics, there's some excellent books, but uh, I can give you more on that later. On page 12, John Stott's Your Mind Matters is a good little, I think it's 64 pages on why the mind is important, and that's a neglected subject in evangelical circles. And then for me, the best book available on a Christian worldview is by Al Walters, Christian, uh, Creation Regained. And actually in our Cambridge Scholars Network for PhD students, that is the one required book that we have for that network. Christian Doctrine. Well, you probably have more access to these kinds of books, so I'm just mentioning a few. Uh, Wayne Grudem, who often speaks here at uh, ELF, just recently wrote a massive, I think it's a thousand, 
uh, 25 pages, Christian Ethics. And he's gone through the Ten Commandments in a thousand pages and showing practical contemporary application of the Ten Commandments to this day. Now, I haven't read the book yet. So it's one of a few books on there that I haven't read, but I'm looking forward to reading it someday when I've got uh, several hours to, uh, to ponder it. But it might be more of a resource as well. Uh, one book that Michael Reeves mentioned last night is at the middle of the page, Packer and Odin, they wrote this book, One Faith. And it really did effectively do away with this um, objection that Reeves mentioned last night, that evangelicalism is so fractured, there's no common core. Well, absolutely, that's absolutely wrong. There is a huge common core, and as a person who's worked with evangelicals around the world for 40-some years, I can tell you, sure, we have our differences, but there's a common core that clearly defines evangelical belief. Then several on Scripture, the reliability of Scripture, missions, Christian leadership. So let me just finish with a few comments about books to avoid. Now, this will get controversial, and you don't have to agree with me on, on these. Uh, this is where I will speak ex cathedra, and it's okay if, if you don't agree. Um, I think it's important, as an academic, um, I have to read some books that are part of research. That's, that's one thing. But I think it's important in our personal reading to avoid some Christian authors, unless it is for academic purposes or research. And I've, I've got four categories here that I just want to mention, and this is just to prompt your thinking about it. Authors with a low view of inspiration and reliability of the Bible. And there's one, one guy that's invented this hashtag, love wins, Rob Bell. He used to be an evangelical. If you have as little regard for Scripture as he has, I, I don't think people should waste their time reading Rob Bell. Because if the Bible is not the inspired Word of God, okay, what else do we have to talk about? I might trust you on where to buy a pizza, but I'm not going to trust you on truth. The second one is authors, and I've struggled with how to word this, authors who focus more on mystical or ambiguous terms instead of clearly affirming biblical truths in direct, understandable language. And this would be people like Ann Voskamp, Agnes Sanford, uh, John Sanford, Joel Osteen. Um, and I think I've already illustrated, even in our marriage, I can easily disagree with somebody theologically. That, that's a different issue. But if there's somebody that's muddying truth itself, then that's a whole other issue, and that's what you have in some of these authors. And I could give you some rather... Uh, grotesque illustrations. And then authors who endorse actions such as homosexuality, which are clearly condemned by the Bible. For instance, one of our great Christian philosophers, Nicholas Wolterstorff, recently endorsed same-sex marriage. Well, all of a sudden, I'm sorry, he's written some great things over time, but all of a sudden his credibility changes for me. Adam Hamilton uh, is a pastor who endorses the same. Jen Hatmaker, who's a women's speaker who endorses homosexuality. Jim Wallace, who endorses a lot of uh, these such, sorts of issues. Matthew Vines. And then authors whose lifestyle fails to reflect biblical truth. So I would encourage you to take time to read. Take time. And in our digital age, we're hearing a lot of warnings that we're living a frenetic existence. But I think it's important as followers of Jesus that our minds be focused and that we're, we're filling it with truth. Now, I hope you understand, I'm not saying that we don't read non-Christian books. Actually, originally I had a whole section on you know, classic literature that I believe helps us understand people better and is not antithetical to truth. I mean, authors like Charles Dickens and Jane Austen and George Eliot and others, we could go on. Uh, uh, Willa Cather, but my focus in this list was classic Christian literature. And of course, I didn't even mention the Christian literature of Tolkien and Lewis or would be obvious on this. So, this is the list from Mount Sinai. 